In 2012, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Peter Moore should never be let out of jail. He has caused too much pain. I can only imagine that he derived some kind of sexual gratification from the killings and the way he committed the murders. He was the friendly local cinema owner, but as the end credits rolled, Peter Moore sought to satisfy his sexual urges with the most horrendous of acts. Moore just simply was out of his mind. He was enjoying hurting. Theatrically dressed in dark clothing, no one knew how evil this sadistic showman's deeds had become. He would be convicted of four of the worst murders I think ever committed in North Wales. Peter Moore was the man in black. In September 1995, the bloodied body of Henry Roberts is found at his isolated home in Anglesey, North Wales. He's been stabbed 47 times. At the time, it was thought to be a one-off, a very tragic and horrible one-off. But the discovery of Henry's body marks the start of a sadistic killing spree which will see four men murdered in just 16 weeks. The dead man's close acquaintance, local cinema owner Peter Moore, would be at its centre. Peter Moore had moved with his parents to North Wales in the 1950s. A passion for the movies means the young Peter captures images from his family's life whenever he can. Very few families, and none in that part of Wales, had a cine camera. The sensitive Peter was in his element. Peter Moore, as a child, was quite effeminate, quite camp, and yes, he was a bit odd, but it's not a crime being odd. The local community mistakenly takes these happy scenes at face value. The Moors are popular. They live in one of the area's most prestigious homes, Darlington House. A shadow of its former self today, at the time this massive property was close to the town's upmarket shops. Psychoanalysts suggest that being raised here irrationally gives Peter dangerous delusions of grandeur. He felt he was better than those in smaller houses within the community. It means he struggles to form friendships. Years later, searching the house, police discover evidence of a conflicted character. In Peter's bedroom, next to cuddly toys, Nazi memorabilia. As he was growing up, Peter Moore would have assimilated the sense of being a rather special uh, young boy, of being different from the other young boys and girls. Living in a rural idyll, the Moors hide some dark secrets from those that they live near. Peter himself was gay at a time when it was illegal to be homosexual in Britain. His father was suspicious about Peter's sexuality, and there were rumours of violence in the Moor household. Now, there has been talk of abuse in the family. Now, what is clear to me is that Peter was damaged goods emotionally. The happy family images depicted in Peter's early movies are far from true to life, and the tensions within Darlington House occasionally surface in the young Peter's temper. He did do something to one lad, grabbed hold of him and hurt him, and he was also stopped for having a knife in the car at one time. As Peter enters his later teenage years, he immerses himself in filmmaking and the star of his movies quickly becomes his mother. He's her only child, a little miracle. Edith Moore thought she'd never be able to have children. She was infatuated with him. Peter Moore uh, was a bit of a mummy's boy, uh, but his mother, I think, exercised control over Peter Moore's behavior. She was very nice, but Peter was still very much her little boy. She ruled the roost there, and he did as he was told. The admiration between mother and son was mutual. He filmed himself pledging undying love and bounding towards her with a bouquet of flowers. But the relationship with his father was somewhat different. He was quite clearly incredibly close to his mother and far less close to his father, who was seen as a bit of a ne'er-do-well, somebody who was a hard-drinking ruffian. 
Mr. Moore was a domineering character and uh, wasn't at all happy with the fact that young Peter was so effeminate and so camp. He would have much preferred to have a macho son. Those outside of the family who knew him thought Peter was more like one of his favorite movie characters. Not macho, but still menacing. Rather like Norman Bates in Psycho, I guess. He was very much a mummy's boy. Peter, fearful of what the neighbors might think and how it would affect his mother, doesn't reveal his sexuality. The impact on his psyche will soon surface all too menacingly. It would have brought shame on his family to be identified as a gay man. Let's not forget, being gay was actually illegal in those days. So any form of homosexual activity had to be conducted underground, if you like, in secret. By the late 80s, two important things happen in Moore's life. Firstly, his father dies. Peter and his mother continue living together, alone. Secondly, he discovers a community of film buffs who meet to watch B-movie horrors. At this stage, nothing too shocking. The stuff we used to watch was the rubbish, the old caged women, zombie flesh eaters type of thing, you know. They weren't the new stuff. I think he was more into the old films. Lewis Colwell became an important figure in Peter's life. He owns this now run-down cinema in nearby Denby. It was a thriving business and Peter, still captivated by the movies, wanted in on the action. By the 1990s, now in his 40s, Peter Moore gets his wish, managing three cinemas in as many areas of North Wales. He becomes a respectable man about town. His image, as it was in his home movie days, is very much the family man. Every Saturday, he offers cheap entry to a children's cinema club and becomes known as Uncle Pete. We had a thing called the Saturday Club, where young parents could drop off the children at about 10 o'clock, I think it was, and pick them up about 12 o'clock, and they could buy snacks and sweeties, and they'd have sort of matinee films for children, uh, cartoons, uh, and a little programme that lasted about two hours. By now, Peter Moore is using his cloak of respectability to cover up some dark behavior. Although he's still living with his mother, she doesn't know that at the cinema, Peter is putting on live sex shows. Increasingly open about his homosexuality, conventional relationships are simply not enough for Moore. He turns to sadomasochism. Sadomasochism is simply those people who are going to be attracted to pain, either inflicting pain or the masochist who would receive pain. Moore was a sadist. Uh, he liked to inflict pain on others. It gave him a sense of being powerful, a sense of being in control. Peter Moore would often invite other gay men to come back to Darlington House to watch him engage in sex. He would go off and dress up in his leather gear and then invite them to go upstairs as he would then beat and have sex with the person he'd invited into his home. In 1995, Moore escalates what he's prepared to do to get sexual satisfaction. When men don't give him what he wants, he takes it anyway. He would wait for men staggering home after a night in the pub and Moore would often appear before these men and club them and knock them to the ground and then he would masturbate over them uh, or urinate over them. His victims were unlikely to come forward. To be sexually attacked by another male in North Wales is something many may feel shameful about. One attack in the Welsh village of Cahin leaves a man so badly beaten he'll be wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. He'd been subjected to a very, very vicious beating, uh, so much so that he'd su suffered some really pretty serious brain injuries, and as a result, wasn't able to properly identify his attacker to the police. Nobody suspects Peter Moore. Forever the theatrical showman, he continues working at his picture houses. Indeed, he becomes a champion for Welsh cinemas and appears on local TV. Peter Moore, was something of a hero in Wales in those days because he single-handedly saved a whole series of cinemas here. And every time he saved a cinema, we did a story about it. 
In 1995, Peter Moore, the local hero, suffers the biggest trauma of his life. His beloved mother dies. She had never discovered her son was gay. Now she was dead, Peter felt free to increase the level of both his sexual behaviour and his violence towards others. He seemed to go a bit more haywire, which was why I was asked if I would have a word with him, try and steady him down, because I'd had the same situation about five years before, and I haven't gone quite as bad as him. But when you've never left home and you've been looking after somebody and the reins are suddenly less go, there's nobody to control you. Comfortable with violence, already guilty of attacks on random men, was Peter Moore about to allow his inner demons to surface? Was his obsession with horror movies about to turn fiction into fact? Moore just simply was out of his mind. He was enjoying hurting. He was stabbing him so regularly. It was just simply he had got lost in the delirium of being in charge of that particular victim. It is September 1995. With his mother now dead, Peter Moore cranks up his sadomasochistic sex life, even putting on shows for a select group behind the cinema screens at the picture houses he still runs. Unbeknownst to the police, he is the man behind a series of random attacks on men throughout the area. Alongside his obsession with horror films and violent sex, Moore has developed a fascination with fascism. He meets a fellow fanatic, Henry Roberts. Well, he was a bit of a hermit, I believe. He was known in local pubs. He used to spend about £100 a week in, in local pubs, but lived in squalor, basically. But he had some unusual items there. For instance, he had he used to have a, a Nazi uh, flag. I think that Moore knew Henry Roberts because Roberts was a bachelor. He was somebody who was gay. He was interested in Nazi memorabilia, as was Moore. But it wasn't shared hobbies on his mind when he visited Henry Roberts late one evening. He made a noise in the yard to cause Henry to come out. He was dressed for the purpose. He was dressed all in black with a, a peaked cap as well. And when Henry came out, um, Henry asked him if he was a Nazi. And at that point, he, he, he stabbed him. Henry turned to move away and he followed him lunging at him as he went. This was quite a frenzied attack. He was stabbed some 47 times. His trousers had been lowered. They were at his ankles. Peter Moore has killed for the first time. To ensure that he has the chance to do it again, he works hard to establish his reputation as a community-spirited entrepreneur. Publicly, he still plays the part of Uncle Peter, the cinema impresario who puts on family-friendly films. He was this perfect gentleman who insisted on playing Mrs Doubtfire for the council to see whether it was suitable. People welcomed what he was doing in opening the local cinemas. I don't think he'd ever have made a fortune out of them, but um, people were just glad in their local communities that he was providing some activities. Peter Moore often used to write to Gareth Hughes, who was a journalist on a Welsh daily newspaper. One of Britain's most qualified graphologists, Elaine Quigley, is able to interpret and analyse handwriting. She believes Peter's letters show that he was keen to make a good impression at the cinemas because it filled a void, one created in childhood. With a very strong left slant, he's learnt to put on charm. Doesn't feel it, but he puts it on. And therefore, people will find him a pleasant guy. He would automatically think it was brilliant to be the centre of attention because that's what he never had. And by doing these cinemas, he probably thought this was absolutely great. Uh, people thought he was lovely, people thanked him. And children love it when they praise. Children love it when they're the centre of attention. And he's still a child. 